Hi, welcome to 118 East South Street. I'm your host, Victoria Mitchell. We are here in downtown Raleigh at the prestigious art space venue, where we sat down with Eric McCray, one of Raleigh's best local artists. My name is Eric McRae and I'm a professional visual artist. African-American family in Northwest Washington, D.C. I grew up with my mom and my dad. My dad passed away when I was relatively young. And I uh, grew up in my family with my brother, my sister, and extended family. Art is not a Sunday afternoon, comfy, laid-back hobby for me. Uh, art is a uh, calling. It's a uh, quest, it's a journey, it's something that I've committed my life to. It's who I am. Um, my mother said I started drawing it too, and uh, no one ever discouraged me from doing it. It was something that um, people thought I was, had a talent at, and they continued to promote it. And when I was in the first grade, um, funny enough, teacher had asked, uh, who wants to help with the bulletin board? And so here I am in the first or second grade, and I'm probably five or six years old or whatever. And so I raised my hand, oh, I want to help. So here I, I, I have this construction paper and I make this thing with Rumpelstiltskin. And then all of a sudden it's just like this, this wow factor. Everybody just responds with such glee. And, and, uh, and then I, as soon as kind of this epiphany took place, this light went off in my head that my talents had a value beyond my own personal pleasure. It was something that other people could respond to and, and have a, a positive reaction. So that in itself gave me the motivation to continue to produce art. You know, you draw your superheroes and your speed racer and you draw a dog that looks like a horse and a horse that looks like a dog and you know, and you're, and you're always just doodling and trying to draw spaceships, you know, stuff that little boys draw. And gradually you, you want to try to draw people in your family. So it's just an evolution. You want to you know, when you're a child, you want to try to draw like a, a grown-up, like a master. And then when you're an adult artist, you want to keep an innocence and a childlike uh, innocence, childlike uh, naivete in your art. So it's a, a process. Throughout my life, I think there was a series of accomplishments, uh, different things I achieved, uh, awards, um, a certain certificates, acknowledgments, doing murals in the public school system, um, all these different things that eventually kind of validated what I wanted to do. And um, it just continued on until I received a scholarship to Maryland Institute College of Art when I, when I left high school. Um, and just it continues today. There's always this series of validations, these accomplishments you make as an artist. Um, when I was in college, uh, it was 1985, 86, I would imagine. Uh, I had painted this, uh, created this piece called um, a Float. And it was a balloon. I was in Baltimore, so more urban environment. And I painted this balloon uh, floating in a pothole. And I just something happened to come across. And here all of a sudden it kind of had this, this intense surrealistic symbolism. And I created this painting which made a name for me relatively young as an artist and I sold the painting while I was in college you know and, and uh, many years later I went back to the, to the attorney who bought the painting and wanted to buy it back but she told me um, Eric uh, this painting is the focal point of my home uh, the professors from the school still come by and see this painting this is just such a great painting she said if I'm sleeping on a heating grate and I had a nickel in my pocket I could sit or sell in the painting. So obviously I don't have a painting, but I wish I did. I was, I was honored. I was honored to know that it had that kind of value and impact on someone's life. 
Uh, but initially, when I created the piece, I knew it, it had it was it was a quality work. The response I had uh, critically and um, was, was favorable, very favorable. But then when I sold it, then it it, it gave me a, an assurance that here I could make a living or make income from my art. And, um, and so, at each, once again, through each step, there was you know, these validations, these, these um, successes that gave me the impetus to keep continue making art. I heard this quote where it says, uh, in, while you're climbing the ladder of, of success, make sure you're climbing the right wall. So I was climbing this ladder of success, but I was on the wrong wall. I'd gotten off track from the goal and the vision I had in my youth of being a successful artist. So at a certain point when um, I thought I was being responsible by being this corporate individual, um, and at a certain point I realized I was making a huge mistake and that I had to make a change. Uh, I was miserable. Um, for me, uh, working in, in, at that time I worked in the computer business, computer industry. I was not a happy person. Part of it was the environment, part of it was the company. I still love computers today. But I knew ultimately I was called to be an artist and I, I was supposed to work as an artist. And if I made this, this grand leap to build a career as an artist, I knew if, I, if I'd failed, I could always go back and get a job. But I knew that if I didn't do it, I would, um, if I didn't go to grab the brass ring, I would have a, a, a huge regret. So I didn't want to live with that. But at the time when I knew that it, the timing was right to make a career change, my family was very supportive. And, uh, and I would contribute a lot of my success to the people around me. And the best way to communicate with people is with more subtleties. Um, many artists build a career on very blatantly obvious political and social statements. <clears throat> and, and, and they have an agenda. And in my art, I don't have an agenda. I, I'm just making art because it's my, it's my diary. It's my, it's my journal of my life. Where I go, people I meet, things I experience. So in the midst of that, if I happen to make some really blatantly hard-hitting statement, it's because I'm, it just happened to be. It's not like, well, today I'm going to really go after this political party or this candidate or this social comment, this piece of social commentary. I'll leave that to other artists. One of my favorite artists, artist named Robert Motherwell, and he has this quote: "says the intelligent." intelligent painter has the history of art in their head. So I spent my life looking at images. Everything from Japanese anime to American comic books to folk art to African American art to European works. I mean just work globally. Uh, Chinese landscape painting, you name it. So all these, all these things that I've just kind of consumed and all that data, all that information is in my head. So then at time when I'm painting and I'm creating, for example, I may be painting a tree and I say, oh, well, Monet made leaves like this. Or Rembrandt did line work on a, on a, on a uh, the trunk of a tree like this. Uh, so all that information would pull from my head. Uh, Peter Max used color like this or uh, Jackson Pollock applied paint like this. The information comes to the surface and then I apply it. Currently, I work in uh, acrylics on canvas, and then also do mixed media collage. So once again, studying the techniques and different styles of various artists, uh, I synthesize these things into making my own kind of uh, visual identity. Uh, in my mixed media collage, I use photography, painting, drawing, uh, reproductions of my own art, and incorporate it to make a new kind of a, uh, uh, image. Uh, in my painting, I tend to paint acrylics on canvas, very direct, and a very painterly expressive style. I try not to get caught up into the trendiness of the art world um, because uh, there's some the powers that be that are saying, okay, this is you know the new hot thing, and then everybody rushes to 
create art like that individual. And I guess I'm, I'm more classic. I tend to respond to the old masters. Um, I may look at a Romeo Baritan or Jacob Lawrence, uh, look at Picasso, Matisse. Uh, these artists are timeless. Uh, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Degas, Monet. Uh, these artists, I mean, I think they'll always have an impact on Western civilization. When I was in art school, um, racial identity wasn't really uh, stressed because um, it just wasn't about that so much. It was more about other issues, other aesthetics of painting and sculpture. Came to North Carolina, and then all of a sudden I was in a circle of artists where their whole identity is like, we're black, we're black, we're African American, we're black, we're black. Well, after a while I realized that people pretty much noticed that when they saw me. And they looked at my art and they got a message, some sort of message. So I quickly learned that my audience wasn't just a black audience. And these artists were just making their world smaller to say, I am targeting this group of people for my art. And I thought my level of skill, understanding was greater than that. I didn't want to be defined by my ethnicity. No more than I want to be known as a male artist. I am who I am, and it's pretty obvious. So in that process, I'm just Eric McRae. I used to work in commercial art and, and, and design work, so creating a label or a, a logo was an art in itself. So then I tried to take those same kind of images and work them into higher art. So then I took a simplistic icon like a heart that so meant so much impact, and then how can I expand on this simple icon and incorporate other concepts? I try to paint things that people know, but paint it in a way they've never seen it before. I want to impact you back to that few seconds. I got to catch your eye. Boom. What's that? A Coca-Cola bottle. That's a heart. What? I've never seen it like that. Then question marks come up in your head. And it, I want to pull you in to explore the art. So with my Coca-Cola paintings, I was trying to, you know, you see the, uh, the standard cliched wine bottle on a table, still life. Well, most Americans don't drink wine like Europeans do with every meal. They drink Coca-Cola. Okay, so now I was approaching an American icon, the Coca-Cola bottle, from a European aspect of French, French cubism, Picasso's cubism. So it's once again back to pulling the ideas from out of your, your head and then incorporating them together. They say Winston-Salem is the city of the arts, but I think Raleigh really is. I think Raleigh, North Carolina is the best place in the state um, to see art, to, to uh, engage um, active working artists. Uh, my studio is located in the Art Space Building uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina, downtown Raleigh. And we have 30 plus uh, working artists in the building. And my studio is here, so you're able to, to interact with artists, to uh, be able to experience the creative process firsthand. You know, you go to a museum, you're seeing paintings, but you don't meet people. Most of the people are dead, unfortunately, you know, so, so in Raleigh, you're able to have, a, through art space, be able to engage artists directly. Um, I think for Raleigh, North Carolina, with the public arts, uh, a lot of working, working visual artists, I, I see it only going bigger and better, especially with the expanse of the economy here, people that can afford art, people willing to fund the arts. I, I feel very strongly that um, Raleigh's the place to be. What advice would I give to a new artist? Develop a thick skin, uh, have a neutrality where the opinions of others don't puff you up so high that it leads to your downfall or it doesn't depress you to the point you surrender. You have to have a neutrality to understand that this is where I am, this is what I'm doing, and I'm willing to learn and grow, but nobody's no individual's opinion is going to shatter who I am. Another thing is that they have a work ethic. Many artists are lazy and don't want to work hard or work consistent at their craft. They wait for the muse to impact them. And it's not about a muse, it's about a discipline. A discipline like an athlete or a, uh, a soldier. 
They don't wait for any kind of muse. They know they have to work out, they have to do these things, and that's just a fact. Be flexible in the sense to open, be open to learning, be coachable. Um, don't let anybody define you, but a more experienced artist can bring something to the table that you can learn from. Um, I want my legacy to be that I want my, my children and my family to see me in a very um, real way, um, to leave something for my children. I think many of us, I'll speak for myself, I'll say in my family, not I didn't have a great sense of the uh, who my ancestors were. I mean, in the sense of even who my grandparents or great-grandparents were. So I would want to leave something that my grandchildren, great-grandchildren can say, oh, this is where I come from. This is who, who I am, part of who I am. This is my family. So I wanted to leave a real solid, finite, tangible uh, artifacts, things to say, okay, this is where I come from. And um, I want people to know I lived, that I just didn't vanish, and I'm gone. When I'm gone, I want something to exist. I want to form of immortality, I guess. All artists seek immortality. Wow, what a gifted artist. If you would like to contact Eric McCray, visit him at mccraystudios.com or visit him on Facebook at www.facebook.com backslash eric.mccray. This has been another edition of 118 East South Street. I'm your host, Victoria Mitchell, and see you soon.